Good morning and welcome to the What's Up News Network being broadcast from Panama City Beach, Florida, the home of the world's most beautiful beaches. I am Jim Free with Jim Free Realty. Please click on the red subscribe button just below the picture. In the real estate market, we have 258 condos available, of which 171 are Gulf Front. In the detached single families, we have 150 units available and six of those are Gulf Front units. In the attached single family, we have 22 units available and two are Gulf Front units. Out of some 11,000 Gulf Front units, we only have 171 units on the market or a little more than 1.6%. Because of the low inventory, prices are still high and is an excellent opportunity for sellers. In the state news, from Capital News Service, Florida continues to outpace the nation in job growth, adding 41,500 jobs in October. The unemployment rate also dropped two-tenths of a percent and 29,000 Floridians rejoined the workforce. The numbers paint an optimistic picture for Florida's economic recovery, and Florida makes up about six and a half percent of the nation's population. In the lighter news, my cousin, three times removed, Billy Callahan, and I were in the registered Angus business and we were running about 100 head of registered Angus. I had been trained in artificial insemination at the Select Sires Company in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we were purchasing semen from Select Sires of some of the top Angus bulls in the country, but we were in need of a cleanup bull because artificial insemination did not always take. I found a young bull named Lemon Powerplay. His heritage was very impressive, so we were able to purchase him for $60,000. Unfortunately, Lemon Powerplay didn't seem to be interested in the cows. We began to panic because we might have given $60,000 for a real lemon. We had our vet examine Lemon Power Play and he said the bull was very healthy but possibly a little young and could be suffering from environmental stress. Transportation by its nature is an unfamiliar and threatening event in the life of an animal. The vet gave Billy some medication to give to Lemon Power Play. I was out of town for a couple of weeks so I called Billy to check on our bull. Billy said, I think he's fine now he has bred all the open cows and has broken through the fence and bred some of our neighbor's cows. I said, my word, what was in that medicine? Billy said, I don't know, but it tastes a little like peppermint. Well, there you go. A Minneapolis couple decided to go to Florida to thaw out during a particularly icy winter. They planned to stay at Regency Towers where they spent their honeymoon 20 years earlier. Because of the hectic schedules, it was difficult to coordinate their travel plans. So the husband left Minneapolis and flew to Florida on Thursday, with his wife flying down the following day. The husband checked in the condo. There was a computer in the room, so he decided to send an email to his wife. However, he accidentally left out one letter in her email address and without realizing his error, sent the email. Meanwhile, back in Booger Holler, Georgia, my Aunt Ella had just returned from Uncle Ben's funeral. Ben was a Baptist preacher who had been called home to glory following a heart attack. Ella decided to check her email, expecting messages from relatives and friends. After reading the first message, she screamed and fainted. Her son, Ben Jr., rushed in the room, found his mother on the floor, and saw the computer screen which read, to my loving wife, subject, I have arrived, date January 7th, 2016. I know you are surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you are allowed to send emails to your loved ones. I have just arrived and been checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Looking forward to see you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. Sure is hot down here. 
I'd like to tell you a couple of stories, um, one involving one of our heroes in World War II. Many years ago, Al Capone virtually owned the city of Chicago. Capone was famous for any, was, wasn't famous for anything heroic. He was notorious. It meshed the windy, the windy city in everything from bootleg booze, prostitution to murder. Capone had a lawyer nicknamed Easy Eddie. He was Capone's lawyer for a good reason. Eddie was very good. In fact, Eddie's skills at legal maneuvering kept, kept Big Al out of jail for a long time. To show his appreciation, Capone paid him very well. Not only was the money big, but Eddie got special dividends as well. For instance, he and his family occupied a fenced-in mansion with live-in help and all the conveniences of the day. The estate was so large that it filled an entire Chicago city block. Eddie lived the high life of the Chicago mob and gave little consideration to the atrocities that went on around him. Eddie did have one soft spot, however. He had a son that he loved dearly. Eddie saw to it that his son had clothes, cars, good education, nothing was withheld. Price was no object. And despite his involvement with organized crime, Eddie even tried to teach him right from wrong. Eddie wanted his son to be a better man than he was. Yet with all his wealth and influence, there were two things he couldn't give his son. He couldn't pass on a good name or a good example. One day, Easy Eddie reached a difficult decision. Easy, Easy Eddie wanted to rectify the wrongs he had done. He decided to go to the authorities and tell the truth about Al Scarface Capone, clean up his tarnished name, and offer his son some semblance of integrity. To do this, he would have to testify against the mob, and he knew that would cost, that cost would be great, so he, he went ahead and testified. Within the year, Easy Eddie's life ended in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago street. But in his eyes, he had given his son the greatest gift he had to offer, and that great, at the greatest price he could ever pay. Police removed from his pockets a rosary, a crucifix, a religious medallion, and a poem clipped from a magazine. The poem read, The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop or at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own. Live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in time, for the clock may soon be still. Now the number two story I'd like to tell you about is a real World War II hero. It produced, World War II produced many heroes. We've discussed several of them. One such man was Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. He was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington in the South Pacific. One day his entire squadron was sent on a mission. After he was airborne, he looked at his fuel gauge and realized that someone had forgotten to top off the fuel tank. He would not have enough fuel to complete his mission and get back to the ship. His flight leader told him to return to the carrier. Reluctantly, he dropped out of formation and headed back to the fleet. As he was returning to the mothership, he saw something that turned his blood cold. A squadron of Japanese aircraft were speeding its way toward the American fleet. The American fighters were gone on a sortie, and the fleet <coughs> was all but defenseless. He couldn't reach his squadron and bring them back in time to save the fleet, nor could he warn the fleet of the approaching danger. There was only one thing to do. He must somehow divert them from the fleet. Laying aside all thoughts of personal safety, he drove into the formation of Japanese planes. Wing mounted 50 calibers blazing as he charged in attacking one surprised enemy plane after the other. Butch wove in and out of the now broken formation and fired as many, at as many planes as possible until his ammunition was finally spent. Undaunted, he continued the assault. He drove at the planes trying to clip a wing or a tail in hopes of damaging as many planes as possible, rendering them unfit to fly. 
Finally, the Japanese squadron took off in another direction. Deeply relieved, Butch O'Hare and his tattered fighter limped back to the carrier. Upon arrival, he reported in and related the event surrounding his return. The film from the gun cameras mounted on his plane told the tale. It showed the extent of Butch's daring attempt to protect his fleet. He had, in fact, destroyed five enemy aircraft. This took place on February 20, 1942, and for that action, Butch became the Navy's first ace World War II and the first naval aviator to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. A year later, Butch was killed in an aerial combat at the age of 29. His hometown would not allow the memory of his World War II hero to fade, and today O'Hara Airport in Chicago is named in tribute to the courage of this great man. So the next time you find yourself at O'Hare International, give some thought to visiting Butch's memorial display. His statue and Medal of Honor is located between Terminals 1 and 2. So what do these two stories have to do with each other? Butch O'Hare was Easy Eddie's son. Now let's move on to the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. This, this trial has has captured the attention of people from all over the world. On Friday, November the 19th, 2021, Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty on all charges in Kenosha, Wisconsin. This proves that our jury system still works the way it should. We were fed a steady stream of lies and misfortune from MSNBC and CNN, as well as President Candidate Joe Biden. These race baiters accuse Rittenhouse of being a racist, white supremacist, and many other racial terms. Joey Reed and Joe Scarborough and other talking heads that had had their programs tried their best to sway their audience and the jury in this case. I spent 37 years working in the criminal justice system, and I feel that I have as much or more experience in the courtroom as these idiots. My dad told me never call anyone an idiot. Sorry, Dad, I just couldn't think of a better term to describe these folks. I am so proud of the jury and the judge in this case because they looked at the evidence and were not swayed by the noise that was outside the court and on the airways. They quickly turned on the judge when they found out he had a I am proud to be an American ringtone on his phone, which they interpret as a dog whistle that he was a white supremacist and a racist. If you blow a dog whistle, you will get the attention of white dogs, black dogs, tan dogs, yellow dogs, and red dogs. Maybe we, we should remind Reed and Scarborough that racists come in all colors. And I believe they are more race baiters than they are racist. The good news is I predict that many of those folks that have libeled and slandered this young man will find themselves in court room soon. There are still some folks that think Rittenhouse randomly shot three black members of the Black Lives Matter movement as they were peaceably protesting. Let's take a look at those that were shot. Joseph Rosenbaum, on December 16th, 2002, he was convicted in Arizona and was sentenced to 12 and a half years for two counts of sexual conduct with a minor. He raked in 42 disciplinary infractions while serving his sentence. He was found guilty of disobeying order in Arizona on April, August the 6th, 2003, April the 28th, 2004, August the 8th, 2005, and on April the 10th, 2009. In Arizona, he was found guilty of assault with a weapon on January 22, 2007, possession of manufacturing of a weapon May the 15, 2008, tampering with security on safety developments on April the 10th, uh, April 10, 2009, and arson and possession of drugs and narcotics on October 23, 2009. In Arizona, he was found guilty of assault on a staff member on March the 16th, 2009, on April the 10th, 2009, and March the 3rd, 2010. 
and on March the 31st, 2010, of obstructing a staff member. On August the 15th, 15, 2017, he was included in the Wisconsin Sex Offender Registry. On August 27, 2019, he was engaged to Carrie Ann Sue Swart. From Arizona, he moved to Kenosha in 2019. He started working at a Wendy's restaurant in Kenosha on October the 7th, 2019. He had an open case for misdemeanor bail jumping, which was filed July the 30th, 2020. The conditions of the bond prohibited him from possession of and consuming alcohol controlled substance without a prescription and from having contacts with his fiancee Swart, including her residence electronics on third party. He was on medication for bipolar disorder, depression. He did not fill his prescriptions. <clears throat> Rosenbaum, age 36, was released the day of the shooting from a Milwaukee hospital where he had been treated for a suicide attempt. Another one of the men that were shot and killed by a Rittenhouse was Anthony Huber. He is seen on video swinging a skateboard at Rittenhouse before he was shot. He was known around Kenosha as in the skateboard community. Huber served a pair of prison stints stemming from family conflict, including choking his brother in 2012. The other party that was shot but not killed by Rittenhouse was Gage Grosskreen. On August 16, 2020, just days before the Rittenhouse shooting, he was arrested by cops in West Alleys for alleged prowling when he was nabbed videotaping police vehicles in a police department parking lot around 1 a.m. Gage appeared to be videotaping personal vehicles in the Rio police parking lot, according to a police report. Gage made clear his anti-law enforcement views and was arrested for prowling booked and cited and released. In May 9, 2015, Gage was stopped by police in Greenfield, about 40 miles from Kenosha after cops reported he had been, his eyes were bloodshot and glassy. With officers recovering a nine metal meter Glock 19 handgun in his vehicle. In 2013, he was charged with smashing the bedroom window at an ex-girlfriend's home at 4 a.m. in the morning with a woman claiming she had been harassed by him on the phone. <clears throat> One year earlier, was hit with a felony burglary charge in New Berlin when cops said that he caught trying to sell three stolen PlayStation consoles. The outlet reported, and in 2010, Gage was arrested and charged with hitting his grandmother in the face during a dispute, during which he also threw a lamp and damaged a wall. The then 17-year-old swung a lamp into the living room wall, damaged the lamp and the wall, and struck across the face with an open hand, his grandmother. Police said he was charged with disorderly conduct and criminal damage. In addition, he has a prior juvenile arrest record that is sealed. I believe that Kyle Rittenhouse owes his freedom to those 12 jurors that weighed the evidence the judge that conducted a fire trial, his attorneys, and most of all, the independent journalists that filmed the entire incident. During my 37 years of experience, most of my court time was as a witness for the prosecution. This case should have never been brought. The district attorneys appeared to have been incompetent or unprepared. One of the first things I learned in law school was never ask a question of a witness if you don't know the answer. Assistant District Attorney, in this case, must have missed that class. I think it is also safe to say that he has never had a firearm safety class. After the world witnessed him pointing an AR-15 in the courtroom with his finger on the trigger. Just a few weeks earlier, a young lady was killed on a movie set when a shooter thought the gun was not loaded. The media will not learn that lesson until they have great monetary losses from lawsuits and lost viewership. 
the Marxist, Socialist, Communist will continue to try to divide this country by race, vaccinated, unvaccinated, social standing, liberal versus conservative, Christian and non-Christian, and any other area that they can divide, divide us on. For we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual witnesses in high places. Ephesians six twelve. Just remember, we are fighting Satan. Until we meet again, may God bless you, your family, and this great country that we live in.